All right, so you will notice that your microphones are not activated yet, but we will be activating them at the end of the presentation for questions. In the meantime, you can use the chat box to type in your questions, and um, I will try to answer them as we go along. Uh, if there's something that I can't answer, then I will ask one of our presenters to answer it at the end of the presentation. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Go ahead and type in the chat if you can hear me good. Ah, thank you, thank you. All right, so you will notice below the chat pod, there is a file share pod. And what you'll find there are three items that you can download at any time during the call. Um, there is a closeout review tool, which is a brand new tool. It's modeled after the art, which is the application review tool. Um, it's a brand new product. If you want to use it, you can. It is a tool. It is not required for you to use, um, but you can fill it out and send it in with your closeout packets. Um, there is also a closeout checklist change change matrix. So if you remember the previous closeout checklist that we had, this will show you what the differences are. And then we also have a copy of the slide deck um, that you can download the closeout training slides. All right, so this is being presented by FEMA Region 6 closeout team. And we'll be talking to you today about how the closeout process works for our hazard mitigation grant programs as well as introducing this new closeout review tool that's just been released. So the presenters today are Amanda Adair, she's our closeout team lead, and our other closeout specialists are Marissa Sadler, Kelly Ball, Michelle Green Gilbert, and Debbie Frazier. And uh, Amanda, you are ready to take it away. Thank you, Chrissy. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, so we're going to get started talking about uh, closeouts, what we're looking for at Region 6 whenever we receive the closeout packages from the recipients. Um, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so there are basically two types of closeout and oops, sorry, we had to jump ahead. Two types of closeout. Um, so for the purposes of this presentation, we're only talking about the Hazard Mitigation Assistance, the HMA grant programs. So under that umbrella of programs are the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, the Flood Mitigation Assistance Program, Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities, uh, and the Pre-Disaster Mitigation Grant Program. So each of those disaster or non-disasters um, can be referred to as a federal award. Sometimes for the HMGP, we, we normally call those disasters. Um, and then underneath all of those awards or disasters are the sub-awards. So all the plans, the projects, and the recipient man management cost sub-awards. So when we get to the end of the period of performance and the closeout liquidation period for the awards and the disasters, um, the recipient will begin sending uh, us at FEMA the subrecipient closeout requests. And as soon as all of those subrecipient closeouts are complete and closed out, then we can begin the federal award closeout, which closes out the entire disaster award, whichever term is applicable. So as an overview, um, as I mentioned, recipients should close out the sub-awards by sending those to FEMA Region 6. As they are completed, preferably, technically we have until the end of the closeout liquidation period to receive those closeouts, but um, in some cases where we have pretty long periods of performance and the projects have been completed for sometimes years, um, it becomes difficult to obtain the documentation needed to complete that closeout because people change, um, documents get lost, um, things like that happen. So our preference is to receive those pretty soon after the projects are completed. And we do keep a, we do monitor um, the quarterly progress reports submitted every quarter um, to FEMA Region 6 by the recipients and try to help you guys keep an eye on the reported progress and uh, which projects we should be seeing for closeout in the next quarter or so. 
Um, also, as you go along, you should be identifying cost underruns and submit deobligation requests to FEMA so we can help better manage the um, disaster fund um, and have that money available for other um, future mitigation activities. Uh, but that also can be taken care of at closeout if you if you prefer to keep the funds available, especially if they're a small amount, in case there's something that comes comes over budget on another line item. Um, specifically for HMGP, um, those disasters that were declared after October 5th, 2018, uh, those are subject to sub or recipient management cost withholding. So for that's 3% for all of the states in Region 6. So once all of those non-management cost subawards are closed, um, this is also the point where that last 3% is released to the recipient for management costs. And the references we're using today for federal award, uh, the closeout process, those can be found in 2 CFR 200.344. And that reference has been updated uh, kind of recently in the last year um, for awards before November 2020. Um, the reference, I think, is uh, 343 on that one. So I mentioned the closeout liquidation period. And what that is, is that's the period of time after the, the period of performance where all final um, Payments should be liquidated and closeout packages should be developed and submitted uh, for closeout. So uh, for the newer awards, that's 120 days. But for those before November 12th, 2020, that's 90 days. So that's the closeout liquidation period. It's either 90 days or 120 days. And the subaward is officially closed out when the request is approved and a closeout letter is sent to the recipient confirming the final federal expenditures for the sub-award. What you're seeing on this slide is a snippet from our new Region 6 review tool, or uh, closeout review tool. Uh, it looks, if you're familiar with doing um, applications and submitting those to FEMA, it looks really so similar to that application review tool, tool art, as Christy mentioned. Um, it is an Excel-based uh, format and it's available for download in our pod. Uh, it was sent earlier this week as well. And I just want to call out, it's, there aren't any blue items on the screenshot, but we did try to um, identify items that were either new, like brand new requirements, or enhanced or reworded previous require, requirements in blue on the checklist. And so we understand, especially for projects that have been completely done, they're just not closed out. There may be some items on there that may be difficult to receive because you didn't realize that you needed them beforehand since our checklist is, is brand new. We can be a little bit flexible on some of those things. Just feel free to work with your closeout specialists as those questions come up. But um, we're going to be going through what we're looking for in general um, when we close out a grant and we're going to try to call out anything that's a little bit new for those of you that have a previous experience in working with closeouts with us. So just as you can see here on this slide, if you can, hopefully it's not too small, but if it is, please feel free to download the slides in the deck or open up the review tool. Um, so we are looking for the final budget, how much was the final federal share, the final non-federal share, and the total project cost. We're looking for the date that the project was completed. That is, when was the project completely finished, all construction costs um, or all construction activities were completed, and the recipient has confirmed that with a final inspection. So we also need that final inspection date. Um, so a final inspection is whenever you've gone out and made sure that the work and that the scope of work was completed properly. Uh, so you should also have an inspection report, which I'll get into in, in later slides about who was there and that everything was in order, what date, what date uh, the inspection was completed, and then often you also include your, your final photographs there as well. So for example, if it was a generator project, you'd want to show that you ran the generator for five minutes and that it, it worked fine. If it's a warning siren, you'd want to show that you did a test to make sure it worked. And then, um, you know, construction projects, you'd want to verify with whoever constructed it 
that you had the documentation to support that it was in compliance with all the standards. For example, community safe room, that it was in compliance with the publication 361. And then we also have a place to record um, the underrun amount, and that should be requested from the recipient. So if you didn't need all of the federal amount awarded for the project, uh, we need to know how much you are requesting that we deobligate from the project. Okay, so one thing we're checking um, at closeout is if a plan exception was granted. So the subrecipient must have a FEMA approved state or tribal mitigation plan in place and they also must have a local or tribal mitigation plan in place uh, before the project is awarded. In rare circumstances, a plan exception is granted. So if a project needs to be awarded before the plan is approved and it's expired, for example, um, the regional administrator for FEMA can uh, grant a plan exception and we can go ahead and award that project before the plan is approved, but the condition is that the plan must be approved within 12 months of the award of the project. So uh, we check to make sure that if that was a condition for the project that the, the plan was completed within a month. If not, um, further consultation is needed because disallowance of costs will likely be uh, have to occur then. We're also checking to make sure that the project was completed within the established period of performance. So the, the period of performance, or we also call it the POP, is the total amount of time, which is sometimes several years, during which the federal agency authorizes a grantee, um, which I've been referring to a grantee as a recipient, to complete the approved work of the project described in the application. So please note the POP applies to the entire disaster or the entire award and all the projects within that. So just because project number one was completed, um, if project number four needs, needs more time, that whole period of performance applies to both project four and one. In general, unless um, extensions are granted to the POP, um, our guidance dictates that the standard period of performance is three years uh, from the date of the um, application deadline for HMGP. And it can vary on the non-disaster side, just depends on what the notice of funding opportunity says, but um, in general, the, the clock starts ticking on that whenever the first um, project is awarded under that award. So we're checking to make sure that uh, we have some kind of confirmation that the project was done within that POP. We're um, checking and documenting that if there were any POP extensions that um, the work was also completed within that new time frame and that there weren't any cost incurred after the POP expired. So as I mentioned, payments can be made after the POP within that uh, closeout liquidation period but it, it's only eligible for work that occurred within the POP. Um, another thing we're checking at closeout is has the project been updated in the system of record? So currently we're working with three different um, systems of record. For HMGP, that's NEMIS, the National Emergency Management Information System. Uh, for our non-disaster grants, that is um, FMA and PDM prior to fiscal year 20, those are in e-grants. And um, if any of you have had the pleasure to work with the, the reincarnated PDM program called LPDM or um, community, community funding, uh, those are also in e-grants too. Um, but anything, otherwise anything newer uh, for non-disaster has, has been in FEMA GO, so FY20 and forward. Uh, we haven't had the opportunity to close out any grants in FEMA GO yet since they're all um, still still being awarded and projects are not completed yet. So um, we don't know for sure if the functionality to, to do an amendment in FEMA GO is there, but we are assuming that when we get to that point, it, it's supposed to be. So in general, uh, whenever a project is completed, uh, the recipient is responsible for doing an amendment in the system of record NEMIS or FEMA GO uh, to capture any final uh, 
property information to verify which structures were part of the project or not, um, and then also to update the budget uh, to verify what uh, line items might have a deobligation in them and what the final project costs were. At this time, we don't have that functionality in eGrant, so we don't require that on the non-disaster side. Um, there's just not a way to do an amendment there for just a small amount. If we, we would have to send the whole application back to you, and um, that causes a nightmare with the record keeping piece. So we don't we don't ask for that at this time. Okay, and then we're checking for duplication of benefits and duplication of programs. So uh, we can't duplicate funds received by or available to applicants or sub applicants from other sources for the same purpose. So the recipient, subrecipient, and property owner, if it's an um, individual property mitigation project, must identify any potential duplication of benefits. Um, the most common ways we see this are if the um, homeowner received a flood insurance claim, a national flood insurance program claim, and they didn't use the money to repair their home that, that funding would have to be deducted from their purchase price um, for an acquisition. As an example there, uh, for duplication of programs, uh, these searches are typically performed as part of the application process. Uh, so this is just confirming that there's not another federal program out there that has also funded this project or would be a better fit or a more appropriate funding agency for the project before it's funded. Um, so this is something that's always been included in our closeout checklist um, from headquarters. But as I mentioned, we do usually check that or we're supposed to check it at the application. So uh, we, we basically just look for this statement in your governor's authorized representative letter. Um, some of our states use a separate form that just verifies they checked for duplication of programs um, and their closeout package, things like that are fine. But um, if push comes to shove, we can also verify it from, from the application side for the DOB. Sorry, for the DOP. We're also looking for a final quarterly progress report to be submitted with the closeout request. Um, so we're typically looking to make sure that it's, if it's not marked final as the final quarterly report, that it's, um, shows the work is 100% complete. We also are looking to match up that the um, final amounts in there match up with what's reported in the rest of the closeout package in the final budget, um, that it's not displaying anything that would make us think the project's not done yet. We're also for um, Construction projects or, you know, non-planning projects, we're looking for a final site inspection. Uh, so this is confirmation that a visit was completed of the project site to verify the scope of work was complete. Um, for acquisition and demolition projects, we're also looking to verify the latitude longitude coordinates for each of the structures. Um, same thing for, for other general construction projects. We need to make sure that the that the um, location that was approved in the application or any scope of work or budget modifications uh, match up with what what actually happened um, to a degree. Like if it's if it's maybe just like two uh, lat long decimal places off in the same vicinity, that's fine. But we just want to make sure we didn't construct a project and pay for the construction of a project in a in an area that we knew nothing about. And that wasn't cleared by our appropriate like um, environmental and historic preservation laws and regulations. Uh, oftentimes with the inspection report, this is where we also see the um, photographs of the completed project. I will call out that we added the word color to our new um, checklist. So before, we didn't necessarily always specify that the photographs had to be in color, but they are really difficult to see in black and white. So color is a new um, thing we're looking for on the completed photographs. And again, you are welcome to submit those with, 
in the same form as your inspection report or just elsewhere in the closeout package is fine. However, I will mention if they aren't included in the inspection report, there is a listing of things that the photo should be labeled with so that we know where they go in case they get misplaced or just to verify that those are the correct photos for that project. So the project number, the address, and the Latin longs. We use these to verify that the scope of work was complete and compare them with the pre-mitigation photos that we get in your application. So it's just another check and balance to make sure we did the project in the right location we all agreed upon. And then uh, with the closeout package, we also require a governor's authorized representative uh, or equivalent certification. We also refer to that as a GAR letter. And there are certain things that the GAR letter has to include, such as um, a statement that the reported costs were incurred within, in the performance of eligible work, that the approved work was completed, and that the mitigation measure is in compliance with the provisions of the FEMA state or FEMA tribal agreement. So here's a couple examples of um, some GARs we typically see from some of our Region 6 states. We're also checking for um, environmental and historic preservation compliance, especially, and I will call out that we do have some um, enhanced language on this requirement in our new checklist. If there were any special conditions identified in that REC, um, Record of Environmental Conditions, which is attached to each project's award letter, uh, we do check for those that close out and we will see we will want to see documentation of those too so uh, for example if the project the rec requires that archaeological monitoring be completed we will want to see some kind of verification that that did happen And uh, we do have a newer process in place for new projects that are awarded where we're attaching with the award letter a technical recommendations report. Uh, so that's really similar to the Record of Environmental Considerations, the REC that the EHP folks do. Uh, the technical recommendation report is our tech team's analysis of the project, confirmation that the project's cost beneficial and technically feasible. And if there are any technical conditions listed in that report, we'll be checking those for a closeout too. So for example, one that could common, commonly be found there is for a drainage project. Um, it could require a letter of map revision. So um, on the front end, when we're reviewing those projects, the tech team is making sure to point out this will require a LOMAR or um, if that's the case so that we, we don't have to um, go back at closeout and try to figure it out and um, maybe have to delay the closeout because the LOMAR wasn't complete because it wasn't clear that it was needed. So Marissa's going to go into a little bit more detail when she talks about drainage projects um, about LOMARs, but this is a general, um, just an overview of, of how long that can take. But please note for closeout purposes, we just need to see documentation for closeout that that process has been started, like a, a document that the, the LOMAR has been submitted to FEMA. We also need um, certification that the entire project was complete in accordance with all required permits and building codes. Um, so generally, this is a statement in the closeout request letter, that GAR letter. Um, some recipients may provide different documentation for this, including a statement or a letter from their subrecipient. Um, I've seen like a, certi a certification from the building code official that, that covers this. Um, there's a variety of documents that we could accept for this requirement. And then again, we want to uh, verify the latitude and longitude coordinates. Uh, for each project site just to make sure that the location um, was all that we, the location didn't change and that all the work was approved before it happened.
And for the lat longs, we are looking for accuracy for up to plus or minus 20 meters or 64 feet. And so in general, this is uh, lat longs to um, six points decimal. And if there are any insurable structures remaining in the special flood hazard area, also known as the floodplain after the project's complete. Uh, we also are checking to make sure that there's um, proof of flood, flood insurance has been provided. Uh, most our, our recipients should all have access to our National Flood Insurance Program pivot system, which is the repository for all of our National Flood Insurance policies and claims. Um, so you should be able to check that on the state side uh, you can also request that the subrecipient uh, or the homeowners provide their declaration page to provide in the closeout package for those uh, projects remaining in the special flood hazard area uh, that require flood insurance. And I will note the flood mitigation assistance program um, is a special case because that, that funding comes from the National Flood Insurance Fund. Um, in years past, their notice of funding opportunity has always specified that flood insurance is required on the resulting structure regardless of their location in the floodplain. So keep an eye out for that. And then uh, I think this is my last slide actually. The, the other thing we're covering or looking for in the closeout is for the repetitive loss and severe repetitive loss properties. So those are um, properties that have had National Flood Insurance Program uh, flood insurance coverage and have had um, several claims. Um, so many claims that they're listed on the database as repetitive loss or severe repetitive loss. Uh, we need to verify that the AW501, or it's also called the NFIP repetitive loss update worksheet has been submitted to FEMA to update that specific property um, in our pivot system to show that it's been mitigated. And um, that should also reduce the flood insurance rates for that property owner if the property shown is mitigated in pivot. All right, and I'll hand it over to Marissa to talk about cost review. Thank you, Amanda. Now we're going to discuss the cost review. This section consists of questions A19 through A28 of the new checklist. So let's start with A19. A19 assesses if the final expenditures were consistent with the approved budget. This includes comparing final cost line items to approved cost line items. This means that there should be no new line items listed in the final cost breakdown provided at closeout. The next question, A20, assesses if totals are accurate and calculated correctly. The reported final cost amounts from the system of record should match the reported cost at closeout. A21 assesses if the required cost share was met for the program. At closeout, the final cost may be different from what was initially estimated at application. So you also want to make sure that the match or the local share still is within that required amount. For instance, for HMGP, it's usually 25%. For question A22, that assessive assesses if there are any in-kind third-party contributions, and if so, were they approved in the budget? So these are contributions that are contribution contributed outside of the subrecipient or recipient. Next is A23, which assesses if additional costs were incurred, and if so, were prior approval obtained from FEMA. As previously mentioned, there should be no new costs that close out. So if the project requires additional funding or a cost item that was not previously approved, then a budget modification request should have been submitted. Additionally, funds can be transferred between line items um, for non-construction projects if it meets the 10% rule. 
And for construction projects, um, if there are a requirement for the use of contingency funds to be used on another cost category. And next, we have questions A24 through A28. Um, the first one is new. Um, well, it's new to the checklist, and that assesses if a final itemized budget summary, also referred to as the final cost breakdown, was provided. So this assesses if the federal and local shares the, and the federal amount to be deobligated, as well as the final and total project costs are documented in closeout documents. Question A25 assesses if any equipment was purchased or furnished. And equipment is defined as any tangible personal property with a useful life of one year or an acquisition cost greater than or equal to the lesser of the capitalization amount threshold for the non-federal entity or $5,000. So whichever is more restrictive. FEMA typically do not furnish or retain interest in equipment purchase. So at closeout, the non-federal entity will have to indicate how the property will be handled. Typically, it is handled in two ways. It could be transferred to another federal project or it could be disposed of. The standard form 428C, which usually requires standard form 428S may be used to satisfy this requirement. However, if the entity has another form of documentation that meets the requirements of 2 CFR 200, they could use those as well. I also want to point out that Region 6 will not require equipment reporting a closeout for permanently installed generators or warning sirens that meet the definition of real property. Next is question A26, which assesses if program income were generated under the project. And if it was, was it deducted from project costs? Program income must be used on current costs and it must reduce the federal and local share instead of the, instead of increase the amount actually committed to the project. So in, in cases where um, program income is used, documentation must be submitted that it was handled appropriately. And the closeout package must indicate whether program income was um, obtained. Question A27 assesses if interest was earned on federal advances, and if so, was it returned to the government? Interest earned in the amount of $500 per year or less may be kept for administrative expenses, and any amount over that amount must be returned annually to the government. Specifically, it must be returned to the Department of Health and Human Services Payment Management System through an electronic medium using either the automated clearinghouse network or a Fed wire fund service payment. And then lastly, question A28, um, it would assess if there are any outstanding issues that may affect funding, such as appeals, procurement reviews, or cost eligibility reviews. Um, if these are ongoing, these must be disclosed at closeout. The next slide depicts um, two tables. The first table is an example of the general cost summary, which we typically see in the closeout request letter or the letter submitted by the governor's authorized representative, also known as a GAR letter. Um, this table is not a requirement, but it's highly recommended as it provides the, in the information in a simple, um, an understandable way. Um, also, the second table is an example of an itemized budget cost summary that aligns with the approved budget submitted at time of application, meaning that the line items match those that were approved. Now we would have Kelly talk about the planning requirements. Thank you, Marissa. Hello, and again, I want to welcome you to today's training. I am Kelly Baugh, Grants Management Specialist from the FEMA Region 6 Mitigation Division on the Hazard Mitigation, or HMA, branch closeout team. 
Today I will be talking about the hazard mitigation planning closeout requirements. There are three hazard mitigation closeout requirements items on the, the closeout checklist. The first item on the closeout checklist is has the recipient verified the activity and approved scope of work and are they consistent with 44 CFR Part 201 mitigation planning? The guidance is Part 6, Section F.1. The sub, out, uh, the sub award closeout request must include the following for planning related activities. The activity must be consistent with 44 CFR Part 201. Did the plan meet 2 CFR 200.201? and the approval letter for the plan would be evidence of meeting this requirement. As you can see on the slide, the reference is the 2015 HMA guidance, part three is ECHO one and part A, 8A14. The second item on the closeout checklist is the hazard mitigation planning closeout requirement um, is for new or updated hazard mitigation plans has a final FEMA approved mitigation plan been adopted by the community? Um, please see 2015 HMA guidance part six, section F.1. The sub award closeout requests must include the following for a new or updated hazard mitigation plan. A final copy of the FEMA approved and community adopted plan must uh, be submitted. The approval letter for the plan would be evidence of meeting this requirement as it will show who adopted the plan. At a minimum, the subrecipient must adopt the plan. Other jurisdictions are not required to do so. We will not take money away for any communities who do not adopt. However, the subrecipient must adopt the plan. The guidance for this is HMA Guidance Part 6, Section F.1 and 2 CFR 200.201. The last item on the closeout checklist that we check for in planning is um, for, for multi-jurisdictional plans, does the closeout request indicate which jurisdictions adopted the FEMA approved plan? The guidance for this item is the 2015 Hazard Mitigation Guidance Part 6, Section F.1. The sub award closeout must include the following for new or updated hazard mitigation plans, a final copy of the FEMA approved and community adopted plan must um, has been submitted. And that guidance is part of the HMA Guidance Part 6, Section F.1 and 2, CF, 2 CFR 200.201. And now I'll we'll turn it over to Michelle Green Gilbert for the safe rooms, uh, for individual safe rooms and community safe rooms. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you everyone for joining us again today for the closeout training webinar. The new closeout checklist had several new additions to the individual and community safe rooms. Listed on the screen, you'll see a compilation of all the new inclusions, and in each one of the following slides, I'll walk you through each one of those changes and the documentation needed to successfully close out the individual and community safe rooms projects. There are five new additional requirements for the community safe rooms and four for the individual safe rooms for a total of nine. The old checklist only had three total requirements for both ISRs and CSRs or the individual safe rooms and community safe rooms. However, the guidance outlined these new requirements and the closeout team will review the closeout packets and ensure compliance. As part of the closeout team, we will work diligently with each one of you all to ensure that um, you meet the requirements or that you comply with the with the requirements and again this is the this is part of the nine new requirements that we require first we'll take a look at the community safe rooms the first requirement is the completed safe room design consistent with the fema fema p361 criteria and engineer certified was a written statement included with the submittal documents as required by FEMA 361, 
2021 Section B 1.1, that the design conforms to one, the provisions of the International Code Council Standard or the ICC 500 design construction for storm shelters with the addition with the addition year specified and two, the FEMA funding criteria, uh, FEMA P361 with the additional year specified included. At closeout, what we're going to be looking for is has the grantee provided a letter from a certified engineer, architect, architect or some type of prof uh, professional um, attesting that the community safe room meets, exceeds, or conforms to the P to the FEMA P361. And the P361 basically is it includes details on the foundation, anchoring, doors, windows, exterior, above ground generation generators, and things like that. The statement must be signed, dated, and included include the seal from the engineer in order to meet or comply with this closeout requirement. The next requirement, did the closeout submittal provide a signed and sealed peer review report from an independent registered design professional that complies with all peer review requirements of ICC 500 section 109 in ICC 500-2020 and further verifies conformance with all applicable FEMA funding criteria. In order to meet this requirement or comply with the requirement, the grantee must submit a peer review report from an independent peer reviewer. This peer reviewer can be hired by the safe room owner or his representative. The peer reviewer report must include the qualifications of the peer review or reviewers, it must be signed and sent or delivered in a sealed envelope to the FEMA designated representative by the safe room owner or his representative. In the report, it must show and include what was reviewed, the recommendations, whether it was accepted or rejected. And if it was rejected, there needs to be an explanation of the safe as to why the safe room was rejected. The next requirement for the community safe room. Did the closeout submittal provide the final as-built as set of construction drawings provided by the registered design professional in responsible, in, in, in responsible charge? At closeout, we will check the closeout packet or grantee file to ensure that the engineer, architect, or the registered design professional provided the sketchings of the community safe room and all the dimensions and details that go along with that community safe room. These as-built drawings must be signed and dated by the registered professional to comply with this guidance. Later on in our presentation, you will see a sample of what some as-built drawings should look like. The next criteria for the community safe room is does the closeout submittal include a vicinity map including location of, of the FSHA if, ap, if applicable. On the screen, you will see displayed a copy of a vicinity map. This is required to show the project's location in relation to floodplains. If it is required or if it's needed, a color photo of the vicinity map must be submitted with the closeout packet to show the location of the, propo of the proposed community safe room. The next criteria for community safe rooms. Does the closeout submittal include a written statement from the registered design professional who performed the structural ob observation as required by ICC 52020 section 111 that the required visits have been made? The statement must also identify any reported deficiencies that to the best of the knowledge of the design professional's knowledge. Each grantee will need a letter from an engineer, architect, or a registered design professional that a site visit has been conducted and that they attest that the bet to the best of their knowledge that the community safe room meets or exceeds the requirements outlined by the ICC 500. These requirements adherence to selections, installations, and maintenance of the uh, community safe room. The grantee can utilize a letter 
or create a form with, this, uh, with the said information to comply with this requirement. Okay, next for the individual safe room requirements. Is a completed safe room design consistent with FEMA P320 criteria and engineer certified? For site built safe rooms where, where FEMA P320 design plans are constructed, constructed, the professional engineer who reviews the selected plan and site conditions is required to sign and seal design plan pages SR, SR 0.0 complete any missing information on page SR0.1 and provide all approved field changes orders. This document should be required for closeout as applicable. Okay. In order to meet this, compli this compliance, the grantee needs to have a form or a statement attesting to the individual's compliance to this criteria. The criteria includes the standards by which the safe rooms are designed, constructed, and comply with building codes. This standard, this, this can also, um, the, you can meet this requirement by either having a standardized form that you utilize, or you can utilize a letter um, to comply with this, but you must include all of the information and all the necessary signatures in order to comply with that. Next, Update the property site information in the respective FEMA electronic application system for each structure to include the following. Okay, all property site information must be input into NEMIS, eGrants, or FEMA Go. Listed on your screen, oh, I forgot, we don't have it on there. Okay, um, in NEMIS, uh, basically, uh, there is a, um, when you go into NEMAS specifically and you put this information, the information that's listed on your screen, uh, NEMAS kind of walk you through each one of those things that you have to put in. If for some reason you miss one of those items, what happens is, is when we go in to close out that project, it's going to give us an error message. And so it's going to it's going to slow the, the grants management person down as well as uh, the grantee. And so you'll have to go in and, and figure out what it is that you left out of that system in order so that you can comply with the closeout. And again, um, each system may be a little bit slightly different, but all of this information that's listed on the screen, like the number of properties that are in the project, the county where this community safe room uh, is going to be uh, constructed, the Latin long uh, coordinates, the post mitigation property use, the repetitive loss number, if that's even applicable, the actual amount paid, and the date of the actual uh, that you paid that amount. All of that information has to go into the system because again, if it's not put in there correctly, it will uh, result in an error message. Okay. The next criteria. For residential safe rooms located in the SFHA, did the closeout submittal include a copy of the elevation certificate, proof of the appropriate level of flood insurance, a copy of the deed recorded, and the acknowledgement of condition of mitigation of property in special flood hazard areas? Um, all of the listed documents must be provided if your individual safe room is located in a special flood hazard area. The elevation certificate is basically what is used to document your compliance with the community floodplains regulations. The proof of insurance is needed to ensure that you maintain insurance for the life of that structure. The deed, as the property owner, you must legally record the property with the county. It has to have the land records with the name of the property owner, which is, probably, which is going to be the person who has the land the legal description of the property, and the notice of the flood insurance requirements. The other part, which is, um, I have a sample on the screen for you, is the acknowledgement of conditions of mitigation of property in a special flood hazard form. And that's a sample form that's on the screen, but all applicants receiving assistance for projects in those areas must ensure that these requirements are met by requesting that all of the property owners, they have to sign this form and it has to be filed with FEMA.
Christy, it's not letting me advance my presentation. Are you on the right slide? I just advanced it. Okay, that's it right there. Okay, that's it right there. Okay, and the last one is for prefabricated safe rooms, did the closed out submittal include approval from the authority having jurisdiction of installation or a signed statement from the installer that the safe room foundation capacity, including thickness, steel reinforcement, and concrete cover, and post install foundation anchors, location and capabilities meet or exceed the corresponding design information submitted in accordance with ICC 500 section 106.2.1 in the 2020 edition. Um, listed on the screen is a sample statement. However, it can also be in the form of a letter. The form must be signed, dated, and attested by the installer or another installer or uh, an installer authority. Um, but also please note on this form, it, uh, midway down on the form, it, it asks for the person who installs it. Um, make sure that a secretary or a clerical person does not sign off on this form because that will result, result in us issuing an RFI because it has to be signed and dated uh, by an, an actual installer or an installation uh, authority. Okay, uh, now I'm going to hand it over to Marissa for her to do the, uh, the drainage and flood control. Thank you, Michelle. I'm going to discuss the flood risk reduction or drainage closeout requirements. This section consists of questions E1 through E4 of the new checklist. Right now, we will focus on just the first two questions. E1 assesses if a map revision was required and was documentation submitted to FEMA for a letter of map revision, also known as a LUMAR. And E2 assesses if as built drawings were provided and if documentation was submitted to verify project conformance with the approved scope of work. For the letter of map revision, a community's base flood elevations may change as a result of physical changes affecting flood conditions. Within six months of the date, the information becomes available, the community must notify FEMA of the changes by submitting technical and scientific data in accordance to federal regulations. The submission of this data ensures that risk premium rates and floodplain management requirements are based on current data. The LOMAR is FEMA's modification to an effective flood insurance rate map, also known as a firm, or flood boundary and floodway map or both. When appropriate, the flood insurance study report would also be revised. The requirement for the LOMAR is usually indicated in the application or in H, I'm sorry, in EHP, Environmental Historic Preservation Documentation. And if required, the closeout documentation must demonstrate that an application was made for a LOMAR. E2 assesses if post-construction at-built drawings were included in the closeout documentation and if they conform to the approved scope of work on file. The non-federal entity must demonstrate that the scope of work was completed as approved by submitting um, other documentation if at-built drawings um, are not available. And these include documents such as a state statement from an engineer, preferably a licensed engineer, or from the subrecipient, as well as photos and or technical drawings. Next on the screen is a sample of as-built drawings, and this is, um, this is typically what we look for, or a similar document, um, when we have a drainage project. Next are the remaining two questions, which are new for flood reduction, flood risk reduction projects or drainage projects. 
The first assesses if a letter from a licensed professional engineer um, was submitted certifying that the design plans conform to the American Society of Civil Engineers ASCE publication 21, I'm sorry, 24-14 and if applicable, um, the approved scope of work. The next question is not new to close out as it was previously captured in the elevation section only, but it is now um, included in the flood risk reduction section as well. And it assesses if any structure is elevated as part of a drainage project was a letter or certification from an engineer or a floodplain manager or a senior local official submitted certifying that the completed structure elevation is compliant with local ordinances and national flood insurance program regulations, including all NFIP technical bulletins. Um, this will be discussed more in the next section, which is elevation. This slide illustrates the ASCE Publication 24-12 booklet, which provide guidance for flood resistant design and construction for interested stakeholders. The first link um, at the bottom of the screen provides highlights for the publication. And the second link is where the publication can be acquired. And now Kelly will discuss the elevation closeout requirements. Thank you, Marissa. Hello, this is Kelly Baugh again. I will now be covering elevation closeout requirements. Um, there are six elevation closeout requirement items on the closeout checklist. The first item on the closeout checklist is, did the recipient provide a certificate of occupancy or community equivalent for each structure in the project to certify that the structure is code compliant? If the community building codes do not require a certificate of occupancy, we just need to know what their standard practice is and get that document. For example, they may, they may do certificate of completions instead. Um, the guidance reference is the 2015 HMA guidance addendum section E as echo point five. Um, then the second elevation closeout requirement item on the closeout checklist is, has the recipient provided a copy of the recorded deed amendment for each property? This is required for all properties within the Special Flood Hazard Area or the SFHA, or rather the, the floodplain. The guidance reference for this is 2015 HMA Guidance Addendum Section A.5 and HMA Guidance Part 3 um, e.7.1. The third elevation closeout requirement item on the closeout checklist has a new component to the requirement. Previously, the closeout checklist question read, has the recipient provided a certification by an engineer, floodplain manager, or senior local official that the completed structure is in compliance with the approved scope of work local ordinances, the NFIP or National Flood Insurance Program regulations and technical bulletins. Um, the new component, um, the new checklist question now reads, did the recipient provide a letter or certification from an engineer, floodplain manager or senior local official certifying that the completed structure and elevation is in compliance with local ordinance and NFIP regulations, including all applicable National Flood Insurance Program technical bulletins. Please note that this letter must be signed by the certifying professional and include the date of the signature. Um, the HMA guidance reference is the 2015 HMA guidance addendum section E.5. The fourth elevation closeout requirement item on the closeout checklist reads, has the recipient provided a final elevation certificate, FEMA form 
for each structure to ensure the structure has been elevated to the approved scope of work elevation. Uh, please see the 2015 HMA Guidance Addendum Section E.5 for this checklist item. Um, let's see, the fifth item is um, enhanced. We have always requested photos, but now uh, it has a more specific requirement to include color photographs. The checklist now reads a front, rear, and side color photograph of the final elevated structure must be provided in the closeout packet submittal. Uh, please see 2015 HMA Guidance Addendum Section E.5. Um, the final elevation closeout requirement on the closeout checklist is the verification of flood insurance for each structure. For this item, please reference the 2015 HMA Guidance Addendum Section E.5. And before I turn it over to Debbie, I just want to go through a list. Um, in addition to the typical HMA closeout pr uh, procedures, the closeout of the structure elevation projects generally include the following items. First, an update of the property site information in the respective hazard mitigation assistance system. For example, FEMA GO or NEMAS in the database base for each structure. This list of items that I'm going over can be referenced in the new checkout um, checklist um, in the enhanced notes section. The second item is a certificate of occupancy for each structure. The third item is a final elevation certificate. The fourth item is a copy of the recorded deed. Fifth is a certification by an engineer. Six are the color photos. And last, the verification of um, insurance for each structure. And with that, I will now turn it over to Ms. Debbie Frazier to discuss acquisition closeout requirements. Thank you, Kelly. Hello, and thank you, everyone, for your attendance. My name is Debbie Frazier. I'm an HM, a HM grant specialist. I review the acquisition, acquisition sections, which consists of questions F7 through F14. Nothing much has changed with this section other than one new question has been added to the checklist. F7, has the recipient provided a copy of the deed recorded for each mitigation property approved in the scope of work? If so, are the deed restrictions recorded consistent with the FEMA model deed restriction language? And what we're, what we're looking for, we're looking to make sure that um, a copy of the recorded deed and attached deed restriction is provided for each property that is participating in that particular project. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, um, the, deed should, the deed should be provided in the closeout packet. You check to uh, ensure that the open space restriction is included in the, um, the deed recordings. FEMA has a model deed that shows the required wording, and this will be part of the process for awarding the project. Next, um, this is the new question, um, F8, what's the recordation completed within 14 days of settlement? So the D transfer the D should have the stamp on, on the recording showing that it has been processed within 14 days of the cash settlement. And we're looking for this stamp to make sure that they have this stamp that's within 14 days. F9 has to record has the recipient provided voluntary participation documentation for each property owner identified and approved scope of work? So the voluntary participation document for each property owner must be identified and must be signed. The voluntary participation are collected with the application. They are not required to be sent twice, so they may be in the closeout packet, 
they may not be in the clothes I pack it. Some homeowners paperwork will have um, still have this in other places and can still be verified if we don't find it in the clothes I pack it. Sometimes it's uh, within the title clothes I paperwork and sometimes it's on the warranty deed itself. A physical inspection, we're looking for the physical inspection sheet for each property must be conducted to verify that there are no physical incumbents to the property. A site survey may be necessary to clearly establish property boundaries. And we're looking to uh, make sure that all the property is clear. If 10 states, if pre-event market value was used, did the recipient consider the DOB in the purchase price? And the uh, um, valuation methodology, the pre-event value should be notated in the closeout packet. If the pre-event value was used, then duplication of benefits should be notated as complete. Any duplication notated and benefits subtracted from the closeout, from the close cost of the acquisition. So, you know, you just need to tell us, yes, that's pre-event uh, market value was used and show some kind of documentation showing that the pre-event market value was used. Next, a post-construction photos uh, of the property site. Photos of the property site after the project implementation must be provided. Color photos must be clearly labeled with uh, sub recipient name, address, latitude, longitude, and, and lat Latin longs coordinates. Photos must show open space, but it's not limited removal of electrical meters and driveways. Were the structures removed by demolition within 90 days of settlement of the property transaction? And was the documentation provided to confirm date of purchase and date of demolition? So uh, we're looking to make sure that the structures were removed uh, within 90 days of the cash uh, deed settlement date. And uh, existing builders that are part of the open space acquisition and demolition or relocation project must be removed and disposed of in accordance with applicable laws within 90 days of the closing and settlement of the property acquisition transaction. The recipient and sub-recipient are responsible for the removal and disposal. Even if there's numerous properties of purchase on different dates, the recipient and the sub-recipient are still responsible for, the, for structure disposal and removal within 90 days of the settlement date for each property. If the property is not removed within 90 days, you can submit the FEMA region administrator may grant an exception that this, uh, the structure, if the structure is seized 90 days, you must sur submit a written justification and you must specify a final date of removal. And at the top, you will see there's a calculator. The requirement can be measured by using a date difference calculator. F13 states, for each property identified in the FEMA Repetitive Loss Database, a complete FEMA Form AW501 documenting the completion of mitigation on a repetitive loss property is required. For each property that's identified in the FEMA Repetitive Loss, a complete Form AW501 document the completion of mitigation on a repetitive loss property is required. And you can find the form on the FEMA website. If the property is not a uh, severe or repetitive loss, then let us know, Send, give us a spreadsheet or some kind of documentation, and let us know which properties are under a repetitive loss and which properties are not. The next question, F14, it says, update the property site information and the respective FEMA electronic application systems for each structure to include the following. And these are the different 
uh, electronic application systems that must be updated. For NEMAs, as Michelle stated, with the property site inventory, it, each element should be updated. Each tab of the, the PSI should be updated. If these tabs are not updated, then we will not be able to close out the project. It will give us error messages. Thank you all for your attendance. And now I will return it back to Amanda. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, I'm going to take us the rest of the way. Thank you for bearing with us. I know an hour is a long time to listen to people talk at you. Um, so now you've got your project closed out. Um, now what? What do I do with all this paperwork? So let's talk about the records retention. Um, since we don't have any um, awards under the HMA program that are renewed quarterly or annually, uh, we're looking at the date that the overall disaster or the overall award was closed out. All the documentation for all the sub-awards has to be retained for three years after that closeout date. So uh, just beware whenever um, you have periods of performance that are lasting seven years or so, Maybe you had one project get done three years into it and it got all closed out. We still need to maintain those records for the full, it, it, that would be 10 years in my example, if the period of performance is over at seven years and we're adding three years. Uh, the period of performance over at seven years, the project, the award was closed out and then we added three years for the retention. And those requirements can be found at 2 CFR 200.334. Um, and there are some exceptions for this, so if there's any litigation, claim, or audit started before the expiration of the three-year period, um, or when a non-federal entity has notified in writing by the federal awarding agency, um, cognizant agency for audit, oversight agency for audit, cognizant agency for indirect costs or recipient to extend the retention period. And if that happens and, and FEMA is made aware of it, well, we will send out a letter to let you guys know to keep your records, even though the um, expiration period um, has not come up yet. Or when real property and equipment are acquired with federal funds. So all of your acquisition projects, um, there needs to be a file maintained for all of those properties in perpetuity. Um, more exceptions, when records are transferred to or maintained by the federal awarding agency or recipient when there are records for program income transactions after the period of performance, and when there are indirect cost rate proposals and cost allocation plans. Okay, and then we've included some resources here. Um, you should be able to use the links on the PDF version of the slides that were downloaded. If not, please let us know. We can get you a, the corrected slide with the, um, the where the links work. But um, so there's a slide for our 2015 HMA grants um, FEMA website, our HMA guidance, a job aids, uh, the monitoring and closeout guidance, which precipitated our uh, new FEMA closeout checklist, closeout review tool. So if you want to see those guys, those are also good resources. They, I think there are 12 of them. Uh, for each project type, and they go into not only what FEMA should be checking for, but also what the recipient and the subrecipient should be checking for and maintaining in, in all of our project files. Uh, the two CFR closeout requirements, uh, closeout OMB revisions, and then we have one additional resources slide for you guys, um, which talks about the HMGP. Sorry, I hit next twice. HMGP management cost, so that's the uh, DRRA policy that I mentioned uh, with 3% set aside for disasters declared after October 2018. Publication 361 for safe room requirements, community safe room requirements. Publication 320 for individual safe room requirements. ICC 500 also for safe rooms and the ASCE 2414 for the flood projects. And then here is our contact information um, and, and our state assignments. So feel free to reach out to any of us at any time if you have questions. 
Uh, but that is our last slide, so we'll go ahead and stop the recording and, and open up for any questions from you guys. Thank you so much for your time.